Remember the patient you imagined presenting with cardiac tamponade. How can you confirm the diagnosis? Here's where obtaining a pulsus paradoxus measurement is extremely useful. While there are a few other conditions that can cause pulsus paradoxus, like asthma or COPD exacerbations, the clinical picture of Beck's triad plus pulsus paradoxus is very indicative of tamponade. There are two different techniques to measure a pulsus paradoxus, but I'm going to teach you the one I find most practical and easiest to perform. Remember that we are looking for a 10 millimeters of mercury or greater decrease in systolic blood pressure during inspiration compared to expiration. So, I start with getting an idea of the patient's average systolic blood pressure, usually from an automated measurement. Then, I get out the manual sphygmomanometer, I'll just call it a BP cuff, and prepare to take the blood pressure myself. I don't ask the patient to alter their breathing pattern in most cases. I inflate the cuff approximately 20 millimeters of mercury higher than the automated systolic measurement. And then very slowly release the pressure while watching the needle and listening. I'm listening for the first time I hear a carot cough sound, which is the beat you hear with your stethoscope that is caused by blood rushing into the artery. Now let me show you what that sounds like in reality. The first Karotkov sound is heard at around 138 millimeters of mercury. I note the pressure corresponding to this first Karotkov sound. Then, as I continue to very slowly release the pressure, I'll see the needle bounce with each heartbeat, but there will not be a sound with every beat, only intermittently. Then we see the needle bouncing, but don't hear another sound until around 110 millimeters of mercury. I wait until I hear a Karotkov sound with every heartbeat or every bounce of the needle. Then I note the pressure when the sound with every heartbeat first occurred, which in this case, was at 90 millimeters of mercury. Now, let's watch that once more without the pauses. Recall the pressure was 138 millimeters of mercury when we heard the first Karotkov sound, and it was 90 millimeters of mercury when we started to hear a sound with every heartbeat. So, the pulsus paradoxus measurement would be 138 millimeters of mercury minus 90 millimeters of mercury, which equals 48 millimeters of mercury. Okay, but what does that have to do with inspiration and expiration? Well, that's exactly what you're seeing. The first Karotkov sound, which happens at a higher pressure, is during expiration. Remember, the sound from the blood rushing into the artery occurs once the pressure inside the artery is higher than the pressure from the blood pressure cuff. Then, during the phase of intermittent sounds, the times when you don't hear any blood flow but see the needle move indicates a heartbeat that is occurring during inspiration. Remember, that the blood pressure is lower during inspiration because of the low cardiac output. So, during inspiration, the arterial pressure drops below the cuff pressure again, stopping the blood rushing in and resulting in no sound. When you hear a sound with every heartbeat, that means you've got down to the point where the arterial pressure during inspiration now also exceeds the cuff pressure. So, note the expiratory systolic pressure, which is when you heard the first sound, and then note the inspiratory systolic pressure, which is when you started hearing a sound with every beat. The difference is your pulsus paradoxus measurement. If you were to look at this pressure tracing on an arterial line, it would look like this. You can see a lower systolic pressure during inspiration and a higher systolic pressure during expiration. 
If the patient has an arterial line in the intensive care unit, you might be able to see these fluctuations on the tracing. But I never rely on the arterial line. I always use my ears to make this measurement. The other method of measuring pulses paradoxus involves asking the patient to hold their breath during inspiration and taking a systolic blood pressure measurement, then taking a separate measurement during expiration. This can be tricky if the patient is short of breath or in distress, so I prefer the first method. There are a few problems to avoid, though. First, if the patient is breathing rapidly, you might not have much time to find the difference between inspiration and expiration. Second, if the pulsus paradoxus is really large, like 20 millimeters of mercury, you may miss it if you do not inflate the BP cuff high enough. I speak from experience when I recommend starting 20 millimeters of mercury higher than the automated measurements. Join me in the next Med Mastery lesson where we'll discuss the ECG and echocardiogram findings in tamponade. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how Met Mastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About Met Mastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.